Chapter 8, India I catch my first glimpse of the Himalayas the next day as we turn the corner in the taxi. After an overnight train journey and a bus ride, we're leaving the plains of the Punjab and climbing into the winding pine-covered foothills of Himachal Pradesh. The mountains span across the horizon, jagged and snow-tipped. I can't take my eye off them. My eyes off them. We get higher and higher, driving around hairpin bends until the driver stops in a small town. Buildings, several stories high, line the main road. Red monkeys chase each other along balcony rails and people sit chai in the cafes. This is as far as I can go, says the taxi driver, stopping in front of a fruit shop overflowing with hanging bananas and baskets of papayas and limes. Dad's glancing at the map in his hand. It's a bit further, isn't it? There's a road that curves slightly to the left. I think it's that one. It's that one. He points to the left fork in the road. The taxi driver opens his door. But it's at least another ten minute drive, says Dad. On the map it looks like you can keep going. Sorry, the driver shakes his head apologetically. He closes the door, opens the boot and unloads our suitcases. You'll have to get someone else to take you the rest of the way. We stand at the side of the road with our luggage and watch the driver pull away. The air is crisp and clear. I bet the road gets worse, says Dad. He probably doesn't want to scratch his car. Grandma nods in agreement. We stand outside a dry food store, next to baskets of spices. I recognise the bright yellow turmeric, dried chilies, and the scent of cinnamon. Two rickshaws fly past and Dad waves them both down. Durga Mountain, he says. A strained look appears on the first driver's face and he shakes his head at the words before the rickshaw rattles away. The second driver purses his lips and follows. Wait, shouts Dad after them, arms in the air. Are we going to have to walk? I ask. Let's ask in the shop, darling, Grandma says to Dad. Inside, I gaze at the shelves of biscuits hungrily. Why do you want to go there? asks the owner, filling a sack with dry kidney beans. I'm managing the new hotel there. He eyes us warily. You won't find anyone willing to go there, but you can hire my donkeys to carry your bags. Thanks, says Dad. Relief flashes across his face. You're not going with us? asks Grandma. I have to look after the shop. Bring the donkeys back when you're done. Outside, he fastens the suitcases to the harnesses on the two donkeys. Follow the road, he says. Take a left at the top and continue on the footpath. You can't miss it. The donkeys' hooves clop on the tar- tarmac. We wind up through the thick pine forest, leaving the town bit far below us until we're surrounded only by trees, high in the foothills of the Himalayas. Polly runs up and down, panting, thankful to stretch her legs. I'm carrying Joey and she pokes her head out of the pouch and sniffs the air, her nose wrinkling. I catch glimpses of a building through the trees. Is that it? I ask, jogging ahead. Must be, Dad shouts after me. The building comes into view and my stomach drops. I wasn't expecting this. The hotel is an abandoned two-storey building with boarded up windows and a rusty blue tin roof. It's surrounded by a chest-high wall covered in overgrown climbers and weeds. A boy in a long coat coat sits on the wall wearing a rigid woolen hat with a flat top and vertical stripes across the front of it in earthy colours. He stands when he sees me. We meet eyes. He's He's a deep and dark. He's almost as tall as Dad, probably a year or two older than me. A big mountain dog with a fluffy tail waits by his side. Polly rushes forward to his dog. Come back, I call, but they're already sniffing each other, tails wagging. Praveen, right? Says Dad catching up to me and approaching approaching the boy. He shakes his hand. We're leasing the hotel from Praveen's father, he explains to me. Hi, says Praveen. My father apologises, he can't be here, but he asked me to show you the place. Is this it? I ask, staring at the dishevelled building. Dad nods. I expect it to be more... Grandma searches for the right words. Ready for guests? We'll have it up and running in no time, says Dad, but I hear his voice waver. Something moves in Praveen's front coat pocket and I look closer. Two baby goats snuggle inside giant pockets on his chest. Their tiny heads poke out at the top with pink noses and floppy ears. One makes a high mewing sound. Are these your goats? I ask. Yes, he replies. I reach forward to stroke them. Hands off, you might scare them. I stop, taken aback. Dad pushes the stiff gate open. I hop onto the wall, pausing at the top and sighing. We really are in the middle of nowhere. Thick jungle and tall pine trees surround us on all sides and beyond it rise mountains and snowy peaks. And beyond it rise mountains and snowy peaks. Grandma leads in the donkeys with our luggage and Joey. We walk through the neglected garden, overgrown with giant daisies, purple orchids and orange lilies. 
Joey squirms in the pillowcase and I stop to adjust her. My arms ache. What's in there? asks Praveen. Nothing, I reply. Is it a goat? No, it's a kangaroo, I say. I've never seen a kangaroo, says Praveen, eyes widening and stepping towards it. Hands off, I reply, mimicking him. You might scare her. Praveen laughs. <laughs> Fair enough. He looks at me for a minute and lifts one of the newborn goats out of his pockets. It's the size of a small chihuahua. They're twins, he says. Be careful, they were premature and aren't feeding properly. I stroke its soft fur. It bleats and licks my finger with its long tongue before nibbling my hand. It tickles. How long since someone lived here? Dad asks Praveen. He shrugs. A long time. We inherited it from my great-grandpa before I was born, but we've never lived here. We have a house down in the village. My whole family lives there and my parents didn't want to be far away from them. So it's just been sitting here empty for years? I ask. He nods and unlocks a padlock on the front door, stepping aside to let us enter. I blink, my eyes adjusting to the darkness of the hall after the brightness outside. Praveen breaks the wooden bars of the window so the lights can get in. Dad opens his arms. Welcome to your new home, the soon-to-be Mountain View Hotel. I roll my eyes. We walk through to a big room with a table and chairs and curtains and a giant fireplace. Everything is coated in a thick layer of dust. I can't even see the pattern on the tattered rug on the floor. I open the curtains and moths fly at me. I sneeze. It smells of mildew. Dead flies lie in piles on the windowsills, coated in spider webs. Nothing a lick of paint can't fix, says Grandma bravely, heading off to explore. Dad nods and runs his hand through his hair. I search for a light switch but don't find one. Cracks run down the stone walls. Ruby, come up here, says Grandma from upstairs. This can be your bedroom. We can decorate it however you want. I'll take the one next to it. There are eight bedrooms upstairs, three downstairs and a big living area and kitchen and three bathrooms. The only room that looks like it's had people in it recently is the kitchen. There are food wrappers and a torch on the side. Who's been in the kitchen? I ask. Mr Bart and Mr Hernand come here sometimes, says Praveen. Who are they? I ask. My hotel bosses, says Dad. Where are the lights? I ask. And the sockets? There's no electricity, says Dad. Yet. Seriously? I ask, shivering. I make a mental note to place a torch in every room. It takes preparation to hide from the dark. It's no better in the bathroom. When I turn the tap above the sink, it makes a glugging sound, but nothing comes out. Where's the water tank? Dad asks Praveen. The water tank turns out to be a swimming pool-sized pond in the garden full of murky green water. Dragonflies skim the surface. That'll explain all the buckets in the bathroom, says Grandma. There's no way I'm showering in that, I say, pointing at the water. Don't worry, Ruby, says Dad. It'll go down to the, I'll go down to the village and rustle up some help tomorrow. I remember the look on people's faces when we told them we were going to Durga Mountain. I get the feeling that no one wants to come up here. I can see why. There's nothing here but this wreck of a building. Grandma soon discovers a cupboard with a hard broom and we spend the afternoon sweeping and cleaning. Praveen disappears and returns with bundles of wood and kindling. Then he climbs onto the roof and pokes sticks down the chimney to check for birds' nests. You'll get cold tonight, he says. You'll want a fire. When he's done, he harnesses the donkey. I'll take these back to town for you. Outside, the pine cones from the cedar trees crunch under my feet. Polly and his dog bark and chase after each other. What's your dog called? I ask. Kutani, he replies. Wait, says Dad, rushing out from behind me. I forgot to ask where the drinking water is. Praveen pauses by the gate. The spring is over there, Praveen says, pointing to the path on my right. And beyond it is the lower path to my village. He points again, this time to the path on my left. Down there is bare rock. It's a giant boulder that sticks out from the slope. Don't ever go there, he says seriously. It's where the bears live. A loud rumbling echoes off the peaks of the, in the distance. I watch as a cascade of rocks slide down a tall mountain. Only a few trees dot its rocky terrain. A cloud fro floats in front. Praveen follows my gaze. And up there is snow leopard territory, he adds. I look at the jagged peak and feel a shiver of excitement.